Hey, financial accounting students. I hope you're ready for chapter four. Um, fair warning, long lecture alert. Chapter four is super long, a bit tedious and complicated. I'm gonna do my best to keep it simple and condense it as much as I can for you, but also try to make sure that you're understanding what's going on here. So first assumption in chapter four is that you already understand debits and credits and journal entries and T accounts. So I hope that's true but chapter four really doesn't show any mercy. So you have to be ready to go. If you're struggling with those concepts, you might need to go back to chapter three or possibly even chapter one or two if you're not totally comfortable yet. So let's get into it. Chapter four is accounting for merchandising businesses. Thus far in this course, we've been looking at service businesses where what they're selling is a service, their time, their knowledge, their expertise. Um, as we move into chapter four, we're going to be dealing with merchandising businesses which sell inventory. They sell actual stuff. So we're going to learn how to record and report inventory transactions, usually in what's called the perpetual inventory system. The appendix to chapter four covers the periodic inventory system. We're going to touch on that lightly just so you know what it is and the advantages and disadvantages of each system and why a company would choose one over the other. But I'm not gonna hold you accountable for the actual transactions in the periodic system, just more an awareness of its existence. We're gonna be focusing solely on the perpetual inventory system. So merchandising businesses, like I already said, generate the revenue by selling goods. And those goods that we purchase for resale are what we call merchandise inventory. Um, that's the long technical title, merchandise inventory. I tend to just say inventory. Um, I get a lot of students when they're writing it, they just write merch inv or MI. That's fine. I know what all of that means. I'll probably most often just say inventory. So before we get too far into the chapter, a big concept that we need to learn, and this concept needs to stick with you all the way through managerial accounting, is product cost versus period cost. So a product cost is any cost that's included in inventory, but more specifically, I would define it as any cost incurred to obtain the inventory and ready it for resale. So any cost incurred to obtain, meaning to buy and get the inventory to us and ready it for resale. So if we have to maintain the inventory while we have it. So examples, your largest product cost is the inventory itself, but it could also include the cost of shipping the inventory to receive it, um, to obtain it. Um, it could include um, storage of that inventory, insurance on that inventory. So those are all examples of product cost. Most often in this course, you're gonna see the inventory itself and then the shipping cost to obtain the inventory will be in your product cost. And those costs are gonna get lumped together and put in the account called inventory. What type of account do you think inventory is? I'm hoping you said asset. Inventory is stuff we have, and we have it right up until when we sell it. And so we'll learn how to deal with obtaining the inventory and holding it as an asset on our balance sheet, and then what we do when we sell that inventory. On the other hand, we have what's called selling and admin costs, or more commonly called period costs, so product costs versus period costs. And these are all of the other costs that are not included in inventory. So costs that get expensed in the period in which they are incurred. So if we think back to the matching concept, the second part of the matching concept says we need to match our expenses to the period in which they're incurred. That's all of these costs. These selling and admin costs need to be expensed in the period that they belong to. But product costs are different in that we're going to hold them as an asset until we sell the asset, we sell the inventory, and then we'll expense them. And that's actually an application of the third part of the matching concept, which says we want to match our expenses to the revenues they generate. So we'll, we'll revisit that part of the matching concept when we learn that journal entry here shortly. So a few concepts about our inventory. 
First, if we take our beginning inventory balance, and then we add in the inventory purchased during the period, that gives us our total goods available for sale. Well, we need to be able to account for all of those goods available for sale. So at the end of the period, we should be able to take a look at our goods available for sale and identify, well, what's left, what remains, and that's our merchandise inventory and asset on our balance sheet. And whatever's not left has been sold and it's gone and it gets expensed to a new account called cost of goods sold, which is an expense on the income statement. Cost of goods sold is often called COGS, C-O-G-S, COGS, cost of goods sold. So that's a common abbreviation in accounting. I know, I know, you needed more abbreviations and acronyms in your life. So there's another one. Um, so a simple example here, if we take our beginning inventory, we have two apples and then we buy three more apples we have five apples available for sale. Well, at the end of the period, if I count up all of my remaining apples and there's only one apple left, what is my cost of goods sold? So there's one apple remaining, that's my inventory, and anything that's not there is gone and therefore has been sold. So my cost of goods sold would be the other four apples. Another key concept for merchandising businesses is gross margin or gross profit. Those terms can be used interchangeably, so don't be confused. Um, and the idea of gross margin is simple math, sales revenue. So that's what we call revenue in a, uh, in a merchandising environment is sales revenue minus cost of goods sold, COGS equals gross margin. So sales minus COGS equals gross margin. And that's an important number in a merchandising business. A business owner or manager definitely wants to keep their eye on that figure. So the gross margin is what's left after the cost of our sales to cover the rest of our expenses and hopefully leave some amount of profit, some amount of net income at the end. Um, in looking at a gross margin, sometimes you can tell a lot about a company. So our gross margin, um, is sometimes reflective of our business model. So for example, Walmart prides itself on very low prices. And so they may only have a very small gross margin on a per item basis, but because of Walmart's sheer size and volume, they'll end up with a high gross margin, but their markup on their products is often very low. Uh, where other retailers, let's say Saks Fifth Avenue, they are not trying to be a low price retailer. They're specifically trying to be a high priced retailer. That is their business model that essentially you're buying an image when you shop, shop at Saks. It's not about low prices. It's specifically about high prices and that only the few can afford to shop there. Um, most likely they're gonna have a very high gross margin on a per item basis but their volume of sales is going to be a lot lower than Walmart because they can't sell to everyone. They only sell to the select few. So per item, they're making more gross margin, but in terms of their overall volume, their gross margin is probably lower than Walmart because Walmart's model is to sell things as cheap as they can to everyone. So two very different business models for retailers and we can pick up on those different business models through their gross margin. So like I said earlier, we're gonna be studying the perpetual inventory system. And in the perpetual inventory system, that means that the inventory account is adjusted perpetually, meaning continually throughout the accounting period. In contrast, the appendix of chapter four studies the periodic system which I just need you to be vaguely aware of and be able to identify its advantages and disadvantages. Um, but in the per periodic inventory system, we only update the inventory account periodically, meaning once at the end of the period. Where the perpetual system, we're gonna keep that inventory account up to date transaction by transaction. So we're gonna be looking at transactions for June's plant shop or JPS and learn how to do inventory transactions in the perpetual inventory system. So we start out at year one, event one, JPS acquired $15,000 by issuing common stock. 
Hopefully you're comfortable with this transaction now. We've been doing it since the beginning of chapter one. So we're debiting cash, making cash go up, and crediting common stock, making common stock go up. So both sides of the accounting equation are increasing, and our cash flow type is FA, financing activity. Transaction two, JPS purchased merchandise inventory for $14,000 cash. Now, if you recall, inventory is an asset account, right? It's our stuff. It's specifically stuff that we're holding for resale, but it's still stuff we have. So it's an asset. So the asset merchandise inventory is going up with a debit, while cash is going down with a credit. So we have an asset exchange transaction. Cash goes down, inventory goes up, and our cash flow type is OA. Normal part of our operations is to buy and later sell our inventory. So speaking of selling, here's our first sales entry that we're going to do together. So JPS recognized sales revenue from selling inventory for $12,000 cash. So we sold a bunch of stuff to customers for $12,000 cash. So cash is going up with a debit and sales revenue is going up with a credit. So an asset source transaction making both sides of the equation increase. Retained earnings is going up because we have revenue, which is resulting in an increase in our net income. And our cash flow type, of course, is OA. This is exactly what we're in business to do. So notice this is event 3A, which implies that there's a 3B as well. Didn't we just sell stuff? Do we still have that stuff anymore? Do we still have that inventory? No, we just sold inventory. We no longer have it, and therefore we need to update our inventory account. So we need more info. 3B, JPS recognized $8,000 of cost of goods sold. So that sales transaction that we just did, the $12,000 of sales, the goods that were sold cost us $8,000. We sold it to customers for $12,000, but our cost was $8,000. So we now need to remove that from inventory on our balance sheet because we no longer have that stuff. So we're going to expense it to cost of goods sold. So we're debiting the expense account, COGS, cost of goods sold and we're crediting merchandise inventory, making our inventory asset decrease by 8,000. So we have an asset use transaction, our assets, specifically inventory is going down, and our retained earnings is going down because we have an expense, cost of goods sold, which is bringing down our net income and therefore the retained earnings. So what we need to see here is that we're expensing the inventory the product cost of inventory gets expensed when we sell it. So thinking back to the matching concept, part three of the matching concept says sometimes, but not always. Well, this is one of those sometimes. We want to match our expenses to the revenues they generate. So we do 3A, 3B together because we're matching the cost of goods sold expense to the revenue, the sales revenue, in part A of the transaction. So if we think of A and B together, what's our gross margin? Can you compute that? Remember sales minus COGS equals gross margin. So 12,000 of sales revenue minus 8,000 of cost of goods sold equals $4,000 of gross margin. So a little bit more on journal entries. Let's make sure we really understand a sales journal entry and get this in our notes. So every time there's a sale under the perpetual inventory system, we have to do A and B. So part A, let's see, part A is where we're going to record the sale and the payment method. Now I say the payment method because it could be cash or it could be on account, meaning accounts receivable, or even in a later chapter, we're gonna deal with 
credit cards receivable. Um, so we'll learn about credit cards in a later chapter. So for now, we'll just say the, sa the sale and the payment method, and the payment method could be cash or accounts receivable. And so that entry would be a debit to cash or accounts receivable and a credit to sales revenue. So part A is an asset source transaction. Sorry, that's sloppy. Asset source transaction making both sides of the accounting equation go up. Then in part B, we have to acknowledge, hey, we no longer have that stuff, that inventory. So we need to relieve the inventory. And so that journal entry will be a debit to COGS, cost of goods sold, so we're expensing it. We debit the expense account, and then we're decreasing the asset on our balance sheet, so we're crediting inventory or merchandise inventory. So when we talk about the third part of the matching concept, we want to match our expenses to the revenues they generate. We're matching this COGS expense to the sales revenue that it goes with. So every time we do a sale in the perpetual inventory system, you have to do A and B. Now here's me being a neat freak controlling accountant. I always want you to do A and then B. Not B and then A, not A, B, A, B mixed together. I want you to do A and then B. I want you to build the habits and the consistency of always doing it the same way, A then B, just like what we have here. Hopefully your writing's neater than mine, but conceptually the same thing. All right, let's keep going. We'll get more opportunity to practice on this, but hopefully you've got this down in your notes and we'll keep using A and then B every time we make a sale. All right, so next, event four, JPS paid $1,000 cash for selling and administrative expenses, meaning period costs. Um, so what are we gonna do? We're paying cash for expenses. So we're gonna debit our selling and admin expense. So when in doubt, debit the expense account. So the expense is going up, which is bringing our net income down. And then we credit cash. Cash is going down with the credit. So an asset use transaction, we see cash going down and we say, see retained earnings going down because we've incurred an expense. And our cash flow type, of course, is OA. Next, number five, JPS paid $5,500 cash to purchase land for a place to locate a future store. All right, so we've got an asset exchange, right? We're using cash to buy land. So land goes up with the debit, while cash goes down with the credit. And we see that here under assets, cash going down, land going up. So an asset exchange. And then our cash flow type is investing activities. We're putting our money into a long-term asset. So, so far in T account form, this is what we've done. We've got our cash T account and we've got a couple inflows and a few outflows and an ending balance of 6,500. In inventory, remember we bought $14,000 of inventory and then we sold 8,000 of it, which got expensed over to COGS, leaving us with an ending balance of 6,000. We just bought land, We've got no liabilities. Under common stock, we just have the common stock issue from transaction one. Nothing in retained earnings yet. Do you remember why? Yeah, it doesn't get there till we close the temporary accounts. So at some point, we would need to close out our, our revenues and expenses and dividends if we have any, but we don't. So we need to close out each of these three temporary accounts into retained earnings. But we've got our sales revenue at 12,000. And then we have our two expenses, COGS and selling and admin expenses. So if our next task is to put together our financial statements, which financial statement comes first? The income statement, right? 
Where can we find data for our income statement? Mm, how about right there? Sales, revenue, right, minus expense. So we'll take minus cost of goods sold, minus selling and admin expense, and that'll make up our income statement. Let's go take a look. So they've crammed together three financial statements all on one screen. A little bit harder, hard to read, but I've seen worse. What happened to the fourth financial statement? What's missing here? We're missing the statement of changes in equity, right? At this point, the textbook tends to sometimes skip over the second financial statement. Um, if they don't ask you to do it as part of a homework or um, a homework problem or something like that, it's quite possible that you still have to compute your ending retained earnings, even though they didn't ask you to do the statement of changes in equity. It's quite possible you're going to need to pencil that out on the side. So you're taking your beginning retained earnings plus your net income minus your dividends paid to arrive at your ending retained earnings. Well, in this case, it's easy because there was no beginning balance, there was no dividends, so your retained earnings just is your net income. So that's nice but that's not always the case. So just be aware of that as you do some exercises and homework problems that they might have you skip over the statement of changes in equity, but you very well may still need to compute your retained earnings on your own. So let's take a look at the income statement. Now, your income statement is always gonna be revenue minus expense equals net income. But here in a merchandising company, we're gonna take a little pit stop along the way. So we take sales revenue, minus COGS equals gross margin. Remember you had figured out earlier the gross margin was 4,000. So gross margin is just a little pit stop along the way. So we take revenue minus this very special expense that is COGS to arrive at gross margin. Then we subtract the rest of our expenses to arrive at net income. So the income statement still is revenue minus expense. We're just showing a little more detail in there. Our balance sheet, we're just taking the ending balance in each of our permanent accounts. So if we went back to our T accounts, our balance sheet is going to consist of all of our ending balances. And then our retained earnings is actually 3,000. Our beginning retained earnings, which was zero, plus our net income is 3,000 minus any dividends. So that's what's showing up on the balance sheet. That's where those numbers are coming from. So we list each of our assets and then we total our total assets over to the right. We have zero liabilities and then we list each of our equities, which is just common stock and retained earnings. And we total it to the right. And then we say, yep, we're in balance. Total liabilities and stockholders equity balances out with our total assets. How about cash flows? How are you doing on your cash flows? Have you gotten it down better? Some of you, I think, still need practice classifying OA, IA, FA, meaning operating, investing, and financing activities. Let's see if we can work through some of these. So when we prepare a statement of cash flows, the best place to go is to our cash T account. And we need to use each and every item in our cash T account once and only once. So let's see if we can figure these out. So first we have cash inflow that came from issuing common stock. What do you think that is? How about FA? Is that what you said? Oh, that's not very dark. Let's try again. How about FA? So I'm just gonna put an F next to the first one. So financing activity, that was money in from our investors, the financers of our business. Um, our next inflow was 12,000, that was from sales. What do you think about that? How about an O, operating activity? Then uh, we bought inventory. So we have this cash outflow of 14,000, that's OA. And then we had a $1,000 outflow for our selling and admin expenses. That one was OA. And then we spent $5,500 on land. So that one's IA. Good. I hope this practice is helping you and that you're figuring these cash flows out. So when we go over to our statement of cash flows, remember, I always encourage you to start at the bottom of the statement of cash flows. 
So we need our beginning and ending cash balance. So our beginning balance was zero, right? We didn't have a beginning balance, so it's zero. Our ending balance is 6,500. So let's fill that stuff in at the bottom and compute our net change in cash. So the bottom of our statement of cash flows, we put in our beginning cash balance was zero. Our ending cash balance was 6,500. Therefore, we have a net change in cash. The difference between the beginning and ending, that's our net change, is 6,500. Then the rest of our work, the sum of OA plus IA plus FA, needs to also balance out to 6,500. So in our OA section, remember we had three items, inflow from customers, outflow for inventory, and outflow for expenses. So we've listed all of those, inflow from customers, outflow for inventory, outflow for expenses. So that works out to 3,000. We had one IA where we had the outflow to purchase land, that's the 5,500. So there's our investing activities. And then we had one financing activity, the $15,000 inflow. And if we take negative 3,000, plus negative 5,500, plus positive 15,000, we should work out to 6,500 net change in cash. So mathematically, we've verified that we've accounted for all of our cash flows. Hopefully we have them classified in the right section, but at least we've mathematically verified that everything's been accounted for. So that's the statement of cash flows. Again, I'm going through it slowly because I know it's one that students struggle with and need more practice with, and I think the more we can practice doing it together, hopefully the easier, easier it will get for you. I always have students complain, well, it's easy when you do it, but when I have to do it on my own, it's really hard. Well, it comes from practice. So let's keep practicing together as much as we can. So what we covered in year one is just really the basic foundation. Um, we buy inventory and we sell inventory. When we sell it, we have to do A and B. So we have a two-part journal entry, A and then B. But we need to cover a little bit more advanced topics here, including transportation costs, inventory returns, purchase allowances, which is pretty similar to an inventory return, um, cash discounts. So as we go into year two, we're gonna incorporate some of these more complicated topics. All right, so we start year two with event one, JPS borrowed 4,000 cash by issuing a note payable. So we borrowed money from a creditor, probably a bank. So we've got cash going up with a debit and notes payable, a liability going up with a credit. So we see both sides of the accounting equation are going up, it's an asset source transaction, and our cash flow type is F. A, financing activity. So that's money in from the financers of our business. Then event two, JPS purchased on account merchandise inventory with a list price of 11,000. What does on account mean here? It means that we're buying something, but we're gonna pay for it later. So we owe money to someone, our vendor, and that's called accounts payable, right? Every time we see on account, we have to decide, is it accounts payable or accounts receivable? So in this case, we owe money to our vendor. So that's a liability called accounts payable. So merchandise inventory, the asset is going up with a debit, 11,000, while accounts payable, a liability is going up with a credit, 11,000. So an asset source transaction, both sides of the equation are increasing and no cash flow because it's on account. So when we do pay later, we're gonna pay some of that accounts payable, then it'll be OA. But right now it's nothing because no cash changed hands. So in the next few transactions, we're gonna see what happens when we return inventory. So with that in mind, I'm gonna go back real quick to event two. So if this is what it looks like to buy inventory, debit inventory, credit accounts payable. I want you to already have in mind what it'll look like to return inventory. So to undo this, right? Wouldn't we just flip our journal entry over? It'll be just the opposite. So event three, JPS returned some of the inventory purchased in event two. The list price of the returned merchandise was $1,000. 
So back in event two, we bought $11,000 of inventory on account. And now in event three, we're returning $1,000 of it. So we're going to unbuy the inventory. So we're going to do exactly the opposite. We're going to debit accounts payable, making our liability go down. We don't owe them as much anymore. And we're going to credit merchandise inventory, making it go down. We don't have as much stuff anymore. So we have an asset use transaction. Both sides of the equation are going down. Still no cash flow because remember the purchase was on account and therefore the return is also on account. So again, event three is literally the opposite of event two. Next, we're going to deal with the concept of cash discounts. So let's read the transaction and then we need to break down some terminology here. So event four, JPS received a cash discount on goods purchased in event two. The credit terms were 210N30. Well, there's some terminology that we need to figure out. So before we can analyze the transaction, let's learn a little bit more about cash discounts. So this is a bit wordy. Let's try to explain it as simply as we can. When we talk about a cash discount, it's a deduction from the invoice price. So the vendor has offered us some kind of deduction, and that's usually based on early payment of the amount due. So they're trying to get us to pay faster. Why would they want us to pay faster? Cash flow. So they're willing to give us a discount if we pay the invoice faster. A lot of times when you buy things on account, you don't have to pay for it for maybe 15, 20, sometimes 30 days. 45 is probably the max that I see. But that vendor might actually really want that cash a lot sooner. Maybe they're having cash flow troubles and they're willing to sacrifice one or 2% of their sales revenue in order to collect the cash sooner. So that's what the underlying reasoning is for offering a cash discount. Um, so the cash discount, the period between the purchase date and the discount period end date is usually relatively short generally 10 days, sometimes you'll see seven days, meaning a week, sometimes you'll see 15 days. Um, during this discount period, the full amount less the discount is due. After the discount period though, the full amount of the invoice is due. So the credit period, which is between the purchase date and the end of the credit period is generally 30 days, that's pretty common. But like I said, it could be 15, 20, 30, even 45 days. Um, and that's up to the vendor to set their rules. So typically when we see cash discounts written, they write it in this format. So this would be 210 net, the N stands for net 30. So we say 210 net 30. That first number represents the discount percentage. So that's a 2% discount. Second number represents the days in the discount period. So 2% discount if we pay in 10 days, and then the letter N, like I said, stands for net. So we say otherwise the net, the full amount, is due in 30 days. Now when they say net, usually the word net means that we're subtracting something. So it would be net of any returns. So if there was any returns. So typically the full amount less any returns. So 210 net 30 means a 2% discount if we pay in 10 days, otherwise the full amount is due in 30 days. So if you're a little more visual, I thought all of this was a bit wordy. So the whole period we're looking at here is what, what's called the credit period, often 30 days. And then usually at the beginning of that credit period, the first seven or maybe 10 days, that's our discount period. So during that first seven or 10 days, roughly, uh, you can pay the full amount minus that discount. Otherwise, after that discount period, you just pay the full amount due within whatever they say the due date is, often 30 days. And again, a little more visual here. So two in this case is our percentage discount. 10 is the number of days that discount is available. N stands for net. We say otherwise the full amount is due in 30 days. So what if I said 315 and 45? 315 and 45 would mean a 3% discount if we pay in the first 15 days. Otherwise, the full amount or the net amount is due in 45 days. 
So the vendor can set their terms however they see fit. But we need to make sure that we can read them so that we can take advantage of any discounts if we want to. So going back to this transaction, JPS received a cash discount on goods pertaining to uh, transactions event two and uh, from event two and three, terms were 210 net 30. So first we need to record the discount and then we'll deal with paying the vendor. Do you remember how much we owe the vendor? Well, it was 11,000, but then we did a return, right? We returned $1,000. So we owe the vendor $10,000. And we're going to go ahead and pay them in the first 10 days. So we're going to take the discount. So normally we, we only record the discount when we're ready to pay. Meaning, yep, I am actually paying in the first 10 days. So I'm going to go ahead and take the discount and then immediately pay what I owe. So when you take the discount, you take 2% times 10,000. We should come up with $200. So we're going to reduce our accounts payable. We owe them $200 less, so that's a debit to accounts payable. And we're going to credit inventory, reducing our inventory. Now, we still have the same amount of goods on hand, right? So we don't have any less inventory. However, what we're doing is decreasing what we paid for the inventory. We didn't pay $10,000 for the inventory because we're just about to pay $9,800 for it instead. So we do record our inventory at cost. We're not worried about the quote value of our inventory. The value of the inventory hasn't changed, but our underlying cost of the inventory has changed. It's not $10,000 of inventory, it's $9,800 of inventory. So debit accounts payable on credit merchandise inventory is the same thing that we did when we did an inventory return back on event three. So the debits and credits are actually the same, but this time for a different reason. It's for a discount. So inventory is going down and accounts payable is going down. So now what do we owe our vendor? Well, it was 11,000 and then we returned $1,000 of inventory. And now we took a 2% discount off of 10,000. So now we need to pay the vendor the other $9,800. So Transaction five, JPS paid the $9,800 balance due on the accounts payable. So we're going to pay them, which is going to reduce the accounts payable by 9,800. So we decrease the liability with a debit and then we're using up cash. We're decreasing our cash with a credit. So we see cash going down and accounts payable going down on our accounting equation and asset use transaction and our cash flow type is OA, operating activity. So our next topic, we need to deal with transportation costs, the costs of obtaining our inventory, and then also later we'll deal with the costs of shipping our inventory to a customer and figure out how to deal with those on our books. Okay, so our next tax task, we need to learn about transportation costs. And technically we need to learn what they refer to as freight terms or transportation terms. Um, so our next transaction tells us the shipping terms for the inventory purchased in event two or FOB shipping point. Well, we don't know what that means yet, but we're gonna have to figure it out. JPS paid the freight company $300 cash for delivering the merchandise. So let's learn a little bit more about transportation or freight terms. So this is how the book teaches it. And I'll be really honest with you. I don't like this method at all. It refers to the seller and the buyer. As a merchandising company, which one are you? Are you the seller or the buyer? Hmm. You better be both or your merchandising company's gonna fail really quickly. You need to buy things and then you need to sell things and then you need to buy things and then you need to sell things. So um, this to me, I find to be confusing. If you wanna study the way that the book does it, please don't let me stop you, but I'm gonna give you an alternative way of looking at our freight terms or transportation terms. So three steps. One, who am I? Now that's not meant to be a deep philosophical question. Who am I? 
you're talking about the shipping point or the destination. So we'll give you two choices, shipping point. Sorry, I know it's sloppy. Shipping point or destination. There, I cleaned that up a little bit. So shipping point or destination. Number two, we need to determine, do I pay? So who pays for the shipping cost? That's the crux here. So am I gonna have to pay or is my vendor or my customer going to have to pay? And then finally, number three, if I pay, and that's an if, then I have to determine how to treat that payment. If I pay, is it, and we have two choices. Is it a product cost? Remember that term, any cost incurred to obtain the inventory and ready it for resale? Or is it a period cost? So if we can get through these three questions, we can figure out any of these shipping terms issues. So if it's a product cost, then that means we're gonna be debiting inventory. And if it's a period cost, so it's not part of obtaining the inventory, maybe it's part of shipping inventory out to a customer, then we're gonna be debiting a new account that we'll talk about in a little bit um, called transportation out. So I'm just gonna write trans out. All right, so those are the three steps. We're gonna walk through those as we deal with transportation costs. Okay, so here I wanted to give you a little visual aid of how I think through transportation costs. So in this particular problem, we are June's plant shop down here at the bottom in red, right? So that's us, June's plant shop. So who am I, the shipping point or the destination? Well, it depends on whether we're buying goods from our vendor, in this case, I've labeled plant warehouse up here, or am I shipping goods out to my customer over here on the right, that's our customer. So in our transaction that we were looking at, we were talking about the shipping costs on the inventory that we had purchased from our vendor. So question one, who am I? Am I the shipping point or the destination? Well, I'm buying stuff that Plant Warehouse is going to ship to me. So we are the destination down here. So I'm gonna write destination well, I'm going to abbreviate it, Dest, destination, and plant warehouse is the shipping point. So they're going to ship stuff to us, and it's going to go from plant warehouse all the way over here to June's plant shop. If we have to pay for it, it's going to be considered a product cost, but we need to figure out, do I pay? So the way these freight terms work, they give us two possibilities. It's FOB, which stands for free on board. And there's free on board shipping point, and there's free on board destination. Well, FOB, free on board, tells you who doesn't pay. So if it says FOB shipping point, then it's free when they load it on at the shipping point and then when it arrives at June's plant shop, we're gonna to have to pay for it. So FOB shipping point means the destination pays. So going back through our questions, who am I for the destination in this scenario? Do I pay? Well, let's say the freight terms were FOB shipping point. That means it's free at the shipping point and therefore the destination pays. So yes, we have to pay. And then number three, if I pay, is it gonna be product cost or period cost? Well, it's part of the cost of obtaining 
the inventory. And therefore, we're going to treat it as inventory. So this would be product cost, and we would debit inventory. Okay. Now, let's change our scenario a bit. So we're deviating from the transaction. Let's say that it's later in the problem and we are shipping goods to our customer. Okay, we're shipping goods to our customer. So we're gonna load things up and ship them over here to our customer. And now the shipping terms say FOB destination. So let's go through our three questions. Who am I? Am I the shipping point or am I the destination? Well, now June's Plant Shop is the shipping point. And our customer is now the destination. Okay. And if our freight terms say FOB, free on board destination, that means it's free at the destination. So then who has to pay? We do. June's plant shop has to pay. So yes, I have to pay. So we move on to question three. If I pay, is it product cost or is it period cost? Well, remember product cost is the cost of obtaining the inventory and readying it for resale. If we're shipping something out to a customer, is that part of obtaining the inventory? Mm, no, it's not. So that's gonna be treated as a period cost, a sell and an admin cost. So in this case, we would debit transportation out. Okay, so debit transportation out. We just expense it right away. It doesn't become part of the inventory cost. Um, now, there's different terms for transportation out. This textbook uses transportation out, but I'll be honest with you, I've never seen that in the real world. I see um, freight expense, delivery expense, postage and delivery, shipping costs. Um, I see a variety of different titles, but in the real world, I've never seen transportation out. But you know what? I kind of like it in that it's directional. I hope when you use that account, you're always picturing shipping something out to a customer, shipping out to a customer, transportation out. Do we have a transportation in? Well, that would be when we're obtaining goods. So buying the inventory and readying it for resale. So we don't have a transportation in, but if you're thinking transportation in, I want you to think transportation inventory and use your inventory account because it's product cost. I hope all that makes sense. We'll keep revisiting this as we go, but let's get back to event six. So they tell us that uh, the shipping terms for the inventory purchase back in event one was FOB shipping point. So FOB, so it's free at the shipping point, therefore June's plant shop, the destination has to pay. And then sure enough, they tell us that JPS paid the freight company. Well, that's nice to know now, but on other problems, they're not gonna tell you who pays. They're gonna tell you that the responsible party paid the freight company. And you'll have to be able to figure out if that's you or someone else. So in this case, they tell us JPS paid the freight company $300 cash. So we're debiting inventory because this is product cost, the cost of obtaining the inventory. And then they're crediting cash. So inventory is going up and cash is going down. So again, we're debiting inventory. The quantity of our inventory is not going up, but the overall cost of our inventory is going up. And remember, we record things at what they actually cost us. And our cash flow is OA. All right, let's keep going. Looks like we have another sale. We see 7A, so there's probably going to be a 7B that goes with that. JPS recognized $24,750 of revenue on the cash sale of merchandise that cost $11,500. So that's all the info we need for part A and B right there. So we start with A, which is record the sale and the payment method. 
In this case, the payment method is cash. So we're going to debit cash, making it go up. And we're going to credit sales revenue, making our revenue go up. So we see both sides of the accounting equation increasing. Assets go up with cash. Equity is going up because retained earnings is going up because we have revenue. And our cash flow is OA. So then there's part B where we need to deal with the 11,500, the cost of the goods that we just sold. We have to remove them from our balance sheet. So part B, we relieve the inventory. So we expense those goods with a debit to cost of goods sold. So we debit COGS 11,500 and we reduce the inventory on our balance sheet. We credit merchandise inventory 11,500. So inventory is going down and our retained earnings is going down because we have an expense, cost of goods sold and no cash flow. Part B of a sales transaction never has any cash flow. Transaction eight, JPS paid $450 cash for freight costs on inventory delivered to customers. Well, there they are kind of ruining our fun again. So they tell us that we pay for it. How about we figure out the, the freight terms then? So if we go back to this, if JPS has to pay to ship something to a customer, what were the shipping terms? Remember, free on board tells you who doesn't pay. So who am I? I'm now the shipping point, shipping out to my customer who is the destination. Do I pay? Well, they answered that for us. Yes, they told us that we have to pay. So what are those shipping terms then? It would be FOB destination. So that's why we're paying at the shipping point. And is this going to be product cost or period cost? And here we see, oh yeah, this is period cost. Product cost is obtaining the inventory. Period cost is shipping it out to a customer. So we're going to be debiting transportation out. So let's skip back to event eight. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We're debiting transportation out. So we're expensing it right away and we're crediting cash, bringing our cash down. So we see both sides of the accounting equation going down and our cash flow is OA. Event nine, JPS paid $5,000 cash for selling and admin expenses. So we're gonna debit the expense account, right? When in doubt, debit the expense account. I'll be honest, selling and admin expenses is a pretty vague expense account title. Um, we wouldn't typically use that in the real world, but that's fine in this setting. So we're debiting the expense account, selling and admin expenses, and we're crediting cash. So again, asset use transaction, both sides of the equation going down, cash is decreasing with the credit, retained earnings is decreasing because we have an expense, that's our debit to sell it and admin expense, and our cash flow type is OA. Event 10. JPS paid $360 cash for interest expense on the note payable described in event one. So they don't give us a whole lot of information about this note payable. Uh, they don't give us the interest rate or the term or any of that. So we're not responsible for computing it. They're just telling us that we paid cash interest, not accrued, but we paid the cash interest. So we're gonna take that interest expense and we're gonna debit interest expense making the expense go up, but our net income and retained earnings go down. And then we're gonna credit cash, we paid them. So cash is going down with the credit. So again, we see an asset use transaction, both sides of the equation going down. And our cash flow type on interest, this might surprise you, it's always gonna be OA. I know the note payable itself, we're thinking FA, but when it comes to interest, whether that interest is coming in or going out, it doesn't matter what the interest is related to. No matter what, cash flow related to interest is always going to be considered an operating activity. So next, we need to figure out how to deal with what's called inventory shrinkage and record those transactions. So inventory shrinkage. Let's look at an example. 
So JPS took a physical count of its inventory and found $4,100 of inventory on hand. So they physically counted it all up and there's $4,100 of inventory there. But when they do the math, if they take their beginning balance plus what they purchased, take away what they returned, take away the discounts, we add in the transportation costs, we should have goods available for sale of 16,100. We sold 11,500, so we should have $4,600 of inventory remaining, mathematically speaking. But physically, they say, nope, there's only $4,100 of inventory there. We're missing $500 of inventory. That's really not good. So that's a problem. Um, sadly, it's a very real problem in business. So when we refer to inventory shrinkage, we're talking about lost, damaged, or stolen inventory. Um, most every merchandise company is going to experience some amount of inventory shrinkage, unfortunately. Um, so sometimes, sometimes companies will have a separate account called inventory loss to record that shrinkage so they can keep an eye on it. And other times we put it directly into cost of goods sold. So those are two different ways of treating it. Um, but the reality is any company is going to experience this. We just need to figure out how to best manage it. Um, unfortunately, a lot of inventory shrinkage, they say it's uh, decreases in inventory for reasons other than sales to customers. So that could include just things get broken and damaged in the course of doing business. But unfortunately, it also includes stolen inventory which we'll talk about more in chapter six when we deal with internal controls. Um, but sadly, a lot of inventory that's stolen, it's not customers stealing inventory. It, that does happen. Um, it's not necessarily burglars in the night stealing the inventory. That does happen. But most often, it's the employees that steal the own company's inventory. So we'll talk about internal controls in chapter six. Either way, if it's not there, we need to consider it inventory loss and figure out how to deal with it. So in this case, JPS took physical count of its inventory, found $4,100 of inventory on hand. So we need to compare that to our books, which are going to show $4,600. And we discovered that we are essentially missing $500 of inventory. So they're going to have us use an account called inventory loss. But as I previously mentioned, we could also expense it to cost of goods sold. And I'll explain the arguments for and against those two choices. So we're going to expense it either way. So we're going to debit inventory loss or sometimes cost of goods sold. So debit 500. And we're going to reduce the inventory, credit inventory 500. So we're forcing the balance in our merchandise inventory account to equal our physical balance of inventory on hand. It's important that our accounting records reflect what is real. Now, how do we know whether to use inventory loss or cost of goods sold? As an accounting student, you're going to use whatever account title they make available for you. So if you're doing a homework problem and there is no T account or no account title in the drop down menu called inventory loss, then it sounds like you're going to be using cost of goods sold. In the real world, how do we decide which of those to use? Well, the argument for using a separate account, inventory loss or something similar, would be that we can keep an eye on our inventory shrinkage, that we know specifically this is how much inventory was lost or damaged during this period, so we can manage that number. Um, if we put it directly into cost of goods sold, it's going to be lumped in with tons of other entries and we're not going to have a solid feeling of what our actual inventory loss is for the period, which makes it harder to manage. We need to know, is this minor or should we, is this getting big and this is a problem that we should be concerned about? So if we mix, mix it in with COGS, we kind of lose sight of it. Now the argument for just using COGS is that that really is part of the cost of selling goods is the fact that inventory loss is going to happen and therefore it should be included in your cost of goods sold and it should have an impact on your gross margin. So those are both strong arguments. Um, I would suggest some of the best practices I see in the real world have an account during the period called inventory loss that you use and then at the end of the period close it out into cost of goods sold so it's also factored into our gross margin. 
kind of the best of both worlds. It creates an extra step, but it allows you to track your inventory loss throughout the period and then also include it in your cost of goods sold at the end of the period and factor it into your gross margin. So, um, but again, as a student, you're going to use whatever account title they make available to you. So you don't have to worry too much about that decision. Next transaction, JPS sold the land that had cost 5,500 for 6,200. So remember that land we bought, we bought it for 5,500, now we're selling it for 6,200. Let's learn a little bit about gains and losses. We made quick reference to them way back in chapter one, but as a reminder, gains and losses are something that arise from doing what we're not in business to do. If we're selling our inventory, that's what we are in business to do, and that results in what we call gross margin. We'd be looking at our sales revenue minus our cost of goods sold, and that results in gross margin. But if we're selling something that we're not in business to sell, in this case land, we're going to compute a gain or a loss. We're going to take the sales price of the land minus the cost of the land and compute a gain or loss. Now all of these are going to be recorded in our financials. We just need to figure out how. So um, as we deal with gains and losses, I'm going to encourage you to use what I call the three questions method. And we're going to use this several times throughout the course, but I really think that this method is going to allow you to solve and troubleshoot a lot of different types of journal entries. So you'll see us use it again later in the semester. Um, we're going to ask ourselves three questions. So question number one, what do I get? So in this case, you're selling land for $6,200 of cash. So what do you get? You get cash. So we're going to debit cash. How much? It was $6,200, right? Okay. Then question two. What do I get rid of? So what am I getting rid of? Well, that's the land, right? We're selling off the land. So I'm going to credit land. How much? Well, the land was 5,500. So we can't, we can't credit land for 6,200. There isn't $6,200 of land. So we get rid of the land. And then question three, what's the difference? That's a D, sorry. So what's the difference? Let's see. Well, I need my journal entry to balance, right? I've got debit of 6,200 and credit of 5,500. How do I make my journal entry balance? Well, mathematically, it looks like we need another 700 on the credit side. And if it's a credit, I know it's a gain. We called gain on sale of land. But now that makes our journal entry balance. So going through that again, number one, what do I get? And the answer is I get cash. We're selling something. So I get cash. And specifically, they tell us that we sold the land for 6,200. So that's where we're getting the 6,200. So question two, what do I get rid of? I'm selling the land. So I get rid of land. And now when we get rid of the land, you can only get rid of exactly the land that you have. And that's $5,500 of land. We can't put 6,200 in there. Okay, we get rid of exactly what we have, no more, no less. And then finally, question three, what's the difference? Well, mathematically, to make this work out, we compute a difference of 700, and it needs to go on the credit side. So if it's a credit, that's a gain. 
And if it turns out to be a debit, that would be a loss. Now, how do I know that? Well, gains and losses behave like revenue and expense, respectively. So gains act like revenues in terms of debits and credits, and they would increase our net income on the income statement. And losses behave like expenses in terms of debits and credits, and they decrease our net income on the income statement. So going back to this transaction, JPS sold the land that had cost $5,500 for $6,200 cash. Well, this is the same thing we came up with, right? This is a three-line journal entry, okay? It doesn't matter what order you put the two credits in. Um, I always leave a gap in the middle. So I do, what do I get? Cash. What do I get rid of? Land. I would put that on the third line, leaving a gap in the middle that I could compute my gain or loss because it could go either way. It could be a second debit or it could be a second credit. So it doesn't matter that these are in a different order. It still does the same thing. So we've got cash going up, land going down, and then it's making our retained earnings go up by 700 because we have gain. Now no, notice they put gain here. Normally that's revenue, right? But gains behave like revenue. We don't consider them one and the same, but they behave the same way in terms of the impact on the income statement. And our cash flow is IA. When we buy land, it's IA. When we sell land, it's IA. So this is a list of all the transactions that we just went through for year two. And then we have all of this now in T account form as well. Again, I find their T accounts a little bit hard to read just because they use these big thick grid lines in there. But um, you can also refer to this in your textbook but we can get the gist of it. So we've got our beginning balance in cash and we have increases on the debit side, decreases on the credit side and our balance. Um, the inventory account's a little bit hard to read, but we've got our beginning balance, um, increases, decreases. And then remember we had to um, deal with the inventory loss of 500. So we end up at 4,100. We've got our land that we sold, so therefore land ends up at zero. Under liabilities, we've got accounts payable, and it nets out to zero. And we have our notes payable still at 4,000, so our liabilities are 4,000. And then we've got all of our equity accounts, common stock, retained earnings. Now, they're already showing the closing entries in here. So they've already got our closing entries plugged in. So they've closed out sales revenue with a debit. They've closed out gain with a debit. And then we've got cost of goods sold, transportation out, selling and admin, and interest expense, each that they show being closed with a debit. And they've put all of that into retained earnings in one giant closing entry. So don't forget, normally the closing entries we would do later after the financial statements, but they're just showing that on the T accounts here so you can see what it looks like. Our next task is to prepare what's called a multi-step income statement. So multi-step, it's still the same idea of revenue minus expense equals net income. They're just referring to taking these little pit stops along the way. So we start with sales minus COGS equals gross margin. Then we subtract the rest of our expenses, selling and admin, transportation out, and we arrive at what's called operating income and then down at the bottom, we have a new section called non-operating items. So non-operating items will include gains and losses and interest, and whether that's interest revenue or interest expense. So here we have our interest expense and we have our gain on sale of land. So we deal with those separately down below and we arrive at our net income of 76.40. So it's a multi-step income statement. It's still revenue minus expense overall, but we've organized things a little bit. Taking a pit stop at gross margin, arriving at our operating income, and then we deal with what's called non-operating items, which again are gains and losses and interest, whether it's revenue or expense. So we're gonna keep moving into a third year at June's Plant Shop. 
And this time we need to look at things that affect our net sales. So that can include um, returns, allowances, and discounts. Just like when we were buying our inventory, we had inventory returns, we can have customers return things back to us, a sales return, but it also creates an inventory return on our end. We can also have allowances and also extend cash discounts to our customers as well. So let's get into it. 1A, JPS sold on account merchandise with a list price of 8,500. Payment terms were 110 and 30. Remember 110 net 30. The merchandise had cost JPS 4,000. Now, first, is this sale cash or on account? Well, it doesn't say cash. Oh, it does say on account. There's the words we're looking for. Even if it didn't say on account, though, and if they gave us payment terms, payment terms imply that it's on account. When somebody pays cash, there's no need to specify payment terms. So part A, we record the sale and the payment method. So this time the payment method is accounts receivable and we credit sales revenue for 8,500. We're gonna deal with the payment terms later if and when the customer pays us within the discount period. So then we move on to part B. Remember part B, we have to relieve the inventory. We no longer have that stuff anymore. So we debit cost of goods sold, 4,000, and we credit merchandise inventory, 4,000, bringing down both sides of the equation. Merchandise inventory going down, and retained earnings going down because we have cost of goods sold expense. Then a customer from event 1A returned inventory with a list price of 1,000. The merchandise had cost JPS 450. Okay, so just like when we do a sale, we have A and then B. When a customer returns something back to us, we have to unsell it. So we're also going to have to do A and then B. So you remember A and then B. So A is where we record the sale and the payment method, but now we're undoing it. So we're gonna flip our debits and credits. So we're debiting sales revenue, making sales revenue go down. That's weird, okay? This is the first time we've debited sales revenue outside of a closing entry. So this should feel a bit strange. But do we have a good reason? Yeah, it's a return, so it's an opposite. And then we're crediting accounts receivable, also making it go down. So we've got both sides going down, accounts receivable going down with a credit, retained earnings going down with a debit, specifically to our sales revenue account that's bringing down our net income. And now in part B, instead of relieving the inventory, we're actually putting the goods back on the shelf. So we're gonna do just the opposite. We're debiting merchandise inventory, making it go up, and we're crediting cost of goods sold. Now that's strange, right? When in doubt, debit the expense account. But here we are crediting the expense account. Do we have a good reason? Well, yeah, it's a return, so everything's opposite. So that credit to cost of goods sold is actually reducing the expense down here. This looks weird, right? It's a double negative. It's reducing the expense, which is making net income go up. So both sides of the accounting equation are going up as we put those goods back on the shelf. So transaction 2A, 2B is a pretty tricky one, definitely worthy of studying. Just like you need to learn how to do a sale, A and then B, you need to make sure that you're comfortable with a return, which is A and then B, but both of them are backwards in terms of debits and credits. Event three, alternative 1A, which implies that there's also an alternative two and probably a part B. So we've got a few things to learn here. So JPS collected the balance of the account receivable generated in event 1A. The collection occurred before the discount period had expired. So our customers paying us within the discount period. Remember, we extended them a discount. I think the terms were 110 net 30. So how much does the customer owe us? Well, it was 8,500 from event one but then there was a return of 1,000 in event two. 
So they owe us 7,500. So if we take 7,500 times 1%, that's where we're getting $75. So the $75 is 7,500 times 1%. So that's where that's coming from. So we debit sales revenue. Again, that's strange to be debiting a revenue account. We're making revenue go down and then we're crediting accounts receivable making accounts receivable go down. Now that part is a little more logical to me that the customer owes us less money, but why debit sales revenue? Well, the reality is that you don't actually have sales of 7,500 because you're willing to accept 99% of that as your selling price. So your actual, actual sales are 7,425, 99% of 7,500. So that 1% discount needs to be removed out of sales revenue. So we need to essentially adjust the revenue account or correct the revenue account to reflect what we're actually willing to accept as the selling price. So we're debiting sales revenue, making it and net income go down, which is bringing retained earnings down. And we're crediting accounts receivable, making our assets go down. And then we collect from the customer. So we collect the other 99% debit cash, 7425, and credit accounts receivable, 7425. So cash goes up, accounts receivable goes down, and our cash flow type is OA. Now we have alternative two. So JPS collected the balance of the account receivable from 1A, but the collection occurred after the discount period had expired. So they don't take advantage of the 1% discount, therefore they owe us the net amount in 30 days. And so they're gonna pay us the whole thing. So we just collect like we would any other time. Debit cash, credit accounts receivable. Cash goes up, accounts receivable goes down. Our cash flow type is OA. Now, alternative two was a lot easier and we got more money. So why would we want to extend a discount and have to deal with 1A, 1B and get less money? Why would we do that? Well, remember the purpose of extending a discount to your customers is to get them to pay you faster. You still want to extend credit to them to build a good relationship, but you want to entice them to pay you faster to speed up your cash flow for your operating purposes. So, Alternative two, we may have gotten more money and it's an easier journal entry to deal with, but it may have taken a lot longer to get paid. Next, we need to figure out how to common size our financial statements and also look at some ratios to evaluate our performance. So first, when we use the term common size, what we're referring to is putting our income statement into percentage terms. So the top line, your sales or net sales. So um, net sales is your sales less any returns and discounts. Some courses actually have you use separate accounts that you have, you'd have a sales revenue account and then separately you'd have a sales discount account and a sales return and allowance account. Um, we don't do that in this particular course. We just have one account for sales and the sales go in on the credit side and any discounts and returns go in on the debit side. And so the total in your sales account is your net sales. So um, just be aware that other courses might do it a little bit differently depending on what textbook they use. Um, but conceptually, it's the same thing. So it's our sales less any discounts and returns. So that's our top line, 100%. Everything else on the income statement is expressed as a percentage of that number. So our cost of goods sold, we take 8,000 divided by 12,000 is 66.6667%. They rounded it. 4,000 divided by 12,000 is roughly 33.33%. 1,000 divided by 12,000 would be 8.25%. Again, they're rounding to the nearest tenth. So we keep going, we're dividing each number on the income statement by the top line that is net sales. So overall, we've got net income of 3,000 divided by our net sales of 12,000. So our net income is 25%. And we do it all again for year two. 
Now the purpose in doing this is that comparing our dollars for year one versus year two, we can see that our sales more than doubled. But what we need to figure out is overall our performance doing well considering that our sales more than doubled. So by expressing this in percentages, by common sizing our financial statements, we get a better idea. So what I see is that our cost of goods sold percentage went way down, 48.5% versus 66.7%. And our gross margin percentage then went way up from only 33.3% to now 51.5%. So that's a big increase in our gross margin percentage. But then we've got some more expenses this year. We've got selling an admin and transportation out, and we end up with operating income of 7,300. Well, without percentages there, I'm not totally clear if 7,300 of operating income based on 24,750 of sales is better than 3,000 of operating income based on uh, 12,000 in sales. But because I have the percentages there, I can see that 7,300 is actually better. It's 29.5% is our operating income. So that's better than 25%. Now in year two, we had a couple non-operating items, interest expense and gain on sale of land. And we arrive at our net income, 7640, based on 24,750 of sales, which works out to 30.9%. Now without those percentages there, I'm not sure if 7640 is better than 3,000 and it turns out it is because we have our percentages that tell us 30.9% is better than 25%. So when we see increases in our dollar amounts, we see our company growing, right? We've more than doubled our sales from one year to the next. That's great, but we also need to make sure that we're managing our expenses and be able to understand, well, do we expect our net income to also double then? Um, so our net income also did go up significantly, but we need to be able to keep an eye on these numbers and understand if we're doing a good job managing our expenses. That brings us to gross margin percentage. We talked about gross margin earlier, which is sales minus COGS equals gross margin. And then to turn it into a percentage, we divide it by net sales. So I'm gonna jump back real quick. This right here is our gross margin percentage. Okay, so you're just taking that gross margin and dividing it by the top line. So 4,000 divided by 12,000, 12,750 divided by 24,750. So the gross margin percentage is gonna indicate how much of each sales dollar is left after deducting COGS to cover expenses and hopefully provide a profit. All other things equal, the company with the higher gross margin percentage is pricing its products higher. So way back at the beginning of the chapter, we had talked briefly about um, a, a company's pricing model and how that's kind of reflected in their gross margin and their gross margin percentage. We looked at Walmart versus Saks. So a company with a higher gross margin percentage is pricing its products higher. So that would be Saks Fifth Avenue they're gonna have a higher gross margin percentage because they mark their goods up excessively, where Walmart is trying to keep their prices really low. So discount retailers are often gonna have a low gross margin percentage, but probably a higher volume of sales, where high-end retailers are likely gonna have a high gross margin percentage, but probably a lower volume of sales because there's not as many customers that are attracted to that. Then we have our net income percentage, also called return on sales. And going back, your net income percentage is this one down here. So you're taking your net income divided by your net sales, your bottom line divided by your top line. So 3,000 bottom line divided by 12,000 top line. So that's 25% or 7640 bottom line divided by top line net sales comes up to 30.9%.
So we're expressing our net income as a percentage of sales, and that offers us some insight as to how much of each sales dollar is left as net income after all of the expenses are considered. So all other things equal, a company with the higher return on sales percentage is doing a better job of controlling their costs. So um, they're saying all other things equal. So if our sales and our gross margin are the same, a company with a higher return on sales is doing a better job managing all those other expenses in the middle of their income statement. So um, put these ratios away into your mental toolkit and we'll be continuing to build that toolkit of ratios throughout the semester and then really applying them when we work on a project toward the end of the semester where we will be utilizing lots of different financial ratios. So that brings us to the appendix of chapter four. The appendix covers the periodic inventory system. And as I mentioned before, I really just wanna hold you accountable for the perpetual inventory system that we've learned in the body of the chapter. But when it comes to the periodic system, um, I just need you to know that it exists and a couple reasons why we might use it and the advantages and disadvantages. So I just wanna to touch on that briefly. So the periodic inventory system implies that we're only going to be updating our inventory count periodically at the end of the period. So it's a practical alternative for recording inventory in a low tech, high volume environment. I would even say low tech, any volume environment. If we don't have a lot of technology and we don't have the resources to implement some kind of technology-based point of sale and inventory tracking system, then we're gonna be low tech and we might lean toward periodic. So in the periodic system, the cost of all of our inventory just gets recorded in purchases. So when we buy inventory, we're gonna debit a new account called purchases, which you don't need to worry about. We don't even have that in the perpetual system. So everything would essentially go into this purchases bucket. And at the end of the period, we're going to count up our ending inventory. Whatever is actually physically there gets moved from purchases into inventory on the balance sheet. But if it's not there, then it's gone and it goes to cost of goods sold. So again, everything goes into the purchases bucket. And then at the end of the period, we're relying heavily on a physical count of our inventory. Whatever's there in that physical count of inventory then gets moved into inventory on the balance sheet. If it's not there, it's considered cost of goods sold and it gets expensed on the income statement. So I'm gonna go check out our textbook real quick. Um, this is roughly on page 240 in your textbook at the end of the chapter in the appendix. It goes over a lot of what we just talked about. So periodic inventory system. So over about on page 240, and they give you an example of journal entries in the periodic system, which again, I'm not holding you accountable for this, but a couple things to note in here, we see the, them using purchases as an account title, purchase returns and allowances, purchase discounts. When they make a sale, there's an A, but there's no B. Under the periodic system, the cost of goods sold is recorded at the end of the period. So when you record a sale, it's just part A, and part B gets done later. And then at the end of the period, they've got this big adjustment to move everything out of purchases and purchase discounts and purchase returns and allocate it correctly to inventory and COGS. So again, I don't need you to learn all of that. I just need your awareness of it. What I wanted to get to is down here under advantages and disadvantages of periodic versus perpetual system. So the chief advantage of the periodic method is recording efficiency, recording inventory trans transactions occasionally or periodically requires less effort than recording them continually or perpetually. Historically, practical limitations offered businesses like fast food restaurants or grocery stores no alternative to using the periodic system. Just the sheer volume of transactions made recording individual decreases to the inventory account balance as each item was sold uh, was impossible. 
So imagine the number of transactions a grocery store would have to record every business day to remain, maintain perpetual inventory records. That would be a lot of work, right? So although the periodic system provides a record keeping advantage over the perpetual system, perpetual inventory records provide a significant control advantage over periodic. With perpetual records, the book balance in the inventory account should agree with the amount of inventory in stock at any given time. By comparing the book balance with the results of a physical inventory count, management can determine the amount of lost, damaged, destroyed, or stolen inventory, meaning shrinkage. We're able to compare our physical records to our books and figure out if we have inventory shrinkage, inventory loss. If we're using periodic system, we have no idea what our periodic, what our, uh, excuse me, what our inventory loss is. Perpetual records also permit more timely and accurate reorder decisions and profitability assessments. So we're able to make decisions faster. Um, we're able to keep an eye on our inventory loss. So there is definitely an advantage to perpetual. When a company uses the periodic inventory system, lost, damaged, stolen merchandise is automatically included in cost of goods sold. So we're going to lose sight of our inventory shrinkage. So that's another uh, disadvantage to the periodic system. Um, down at the bottom here, they mention that advances in technology like electronic barcode scanning um, have increased our ability to utilize computers and um, technology to make perpetual inventory systems more I guess more accessible for even small businesses. Um, so um, they've eliminated most of those practical constraints that small businesses used to deal with. Um, so low tech, high volume um, environments still might be using periodic, but it just depends on what kind of technology they've implemented. They have to weigh out the cost of implementing that kind of technology versus the benefits of it. So. That's what I wanted you to know about perpetual versus periodic. Um, if you think about periodic, and I'll just give you a quick example. If you're going into a local small restaurant, you're going into Joe's hamburger shop, and you decide that you want to order a cheeseburger, and you go up to the counter to order a cheeseburger, they charge you $5. So there's part A of your sale, debit, cash, credit sales revenue for $5. Do you think there's somebody recording part B of that transaction? Do they know the cost of your cheeseburger? Well, they probably know roughly the cost of it, right? They determined how to price it on the menu. They know about how much money they make when they sell a cheeseburger. But do you think they know it precisely? Eh, maybe not. Then let's say you ask for, oh, I want extra ketchup and extra pickles on my cheeseburger. So what goes into a cheeseburger? You've got a bun, you've got a meat-like patty, you've got cheese, you've got maybe lettuce and onions, and now I've asked for extra pickles and extra ketchup. So when you look at all the components that go into a cheeseburger, do you think there's somebody sitting in the back room computing the cost of your cheeseburger so that they can record part B of that sales entry? Well, Knowing that it's a small local restaurant, I'm going to say probably not. They're probably going to use the periodic inventory system. And they're probably just going to count their inventory once at the end of the period. And whatever's not there is going to be their cost of goods sold. So that's an example of a type of business where it may not be practical to try to do perpetual inventory. Well, I mean, you could, you could mathematically compute the cost of each and every pickle and each slice of cheese and the cost of the bun, but the burden of doing that, I think would outweigh any potential benefit from using the perpetual system. So that would be an environment where we'd probably see a periodic inventory system. So as you're studying chapter four, and working through your homework. If you see anything that looks like these journal entries here that uses purchases and purchase returns, purchase discounts, um, that is not what I need you to study. 
I don't need you to learn those entries. So please be aware. Don't, don't let that mess up the perpetual inventory system in your brain. I just want you to be aware that this exists. I don't need you to study the details of it and how to record it. Um, so focus in on the perpetual inventory system in the body of the chapter, and then just have a general awareness of the periodic system, the advantages and disadvantages, and who might use it and why. Here they're just showing you a quick schedule of cost of goods sold. And again, we would only be using this in a periodic environment. So this is how it would work, but I don't need you to be responsible for doing all of that right now. So finally, that's it on chapter four. That was a long one. Please study and work hard on your homework. Let me know how I can help you. You guys know where to find me.